Welcome to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari Shrike, the artist and creator behind Not Sorry Art and Not Sorry Art School. I'm so excited to talk art and creativity with you. So grab a drink, grab a snack, and let's dive in. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari. Thank you for being here. And as the episode title sort of alludes to, today's episode is about niching down and sort of the benefits of it, and then also the reason why it may not be good advice for artists. And I know that seems counterintuitive, and the hope of this episode is to sort of break down what niching means, how it can help an artist, and when to sort of go against good marketing advice for the sake of your creative practice. So two things I wanna do kind of at the top of the episode is define niching down. Um, For the handful of you who don't know what that means, first, oh my goodness, bless you. (laughs) I feel like from the minute I started trying to pursue art in any real capacity, I've had to learn how to run a business. And some of the first advice you get when you type in how to sell art (laughs) is niching down. And so if if you haven't been bombarded with that, that's... That's amazing. But the idea of niching down is that in order to be more recognizable, to be more professional, to look more streamlined, to be better at selling your art, you have to focus and sort of narrow down what you're doing, what you're saying, your style, in order to have a better chance at selling your artwork, at competing and standing out against other people who are making art. The other thing that's important to mention is that I feel like, especially for visual artists, and certainly there's some of this in other creative fields, but for visual artists who are actually selling a physical thing and usually through like a storefront or through a gallery, you have to sort of learn how to run a business, assuming that you're trying to make money off of it. If you are someone who's a hobby painter and you just post to your Instagram and you have no interest in marketing, you're welcome to listen, but this probably is not gonna be super pertinent for you. But the idea is that for most people, running a small business and being an artist are sort of one in the same to some extent. And one of the things I find particularly hard to sift through as a little baby artist, as a new small business owner, is sometimes advice sort of targeted towards small business owners might be advice that's really harmful for artists and it doesn't always fit because something can be good business advice and yet because of the nature of being an artist can be really bad advice for artists and it's hard to sift through those things I always have a heart for artists trying to sift through this and this is a truth on so many different fronts of running a small artist business but today I'm going to specifically tackle niching down. So more than being just an advice episode or five things you can do to market yourself or something like that, I'm hoping to show you guys a little bit of what I've sifted through and to really show you that there's no one way to run an art business and that if you sort of take a more intuitive approach to marketing and really break down what feels good, what feels right, what feels authentic, that can be a really helpful element to incorporate into your marketing strategy. So if that sounds interesting to you, please keep listening. Thank you guys for being here and let's just dive into it. So I think the first time I heard about niching down was probably in 2016 or 17. I was in my year, my first year of making art, and it was really still just a small hobby sort of thing. And I started listening to small business podcasts while I painted or while I did tasks around the home. And I remember there was a podcast, I forget its name, it was something like Whole Milk Podcast. It was really sweet, but a lot of the advice... I think was really good and helpful, but it was a podcast more specifically about being a small business. So these are people who are selling jewelry, who are selling courses, who are selling, you know, nutrition guides, PDFs, all kinds of things, and not just art. And so sometimes the advice felt really applicable. And sometimes, I think maybe even more than not, the advice kind of felt scary and as someone who was really new to it all I couldn't decide what was scary because it was new and different and what was scary because my intuition was saying this doesn't feel right. One of the pieces of advice that typically caught me off guard was the idea that you have to focus on one thing and one thing alone 
to really create a recognizable brand. And I'll just start by saying that this is not inherently bad advice, particularly for small business owners. So an example of a business where this would be really applicable is if somebody wants to sell their grandma's tea recipes, she has these great herbal medicinal teas, you probably would not be in a good position to all of a sudden start selling pizza crust or I mean, I'm, I'm just spitballing here or all of a sudden you start selling an ebook on how to have a garden you might think that this makes sense because you like tea and you like having a garden and maybe your vision in the future is that the garden component of your tea brand makes sense but the advice is always about, especially in the beginning, while you're trying to gain recognizability and a footing by really honing in on a hero product or one thing that you do really, really well and one story that can be conveyed in one product, one finished thing, that you should focus on the tea. And maybe you have a couple different kinds of tea, but that's what you should focus on. So this isn't inherently bad advice, right? So why is it beneficial to niche down by by trimming the fat by focusing in on one thing how is that helpful for a brand so anytime you post on instagram or tiktok or pinterest or maybe even in a print magazine when someone's flipping through those pages or scrolling they're only looking at your feed your picture for a really short amount of time and there are metrics for this i cannot for the life of me find the statistic that said how long people spent looking at one instagram post i remember it being like a couple of seconds like two or three seconds and I did just look up how much time someone spends looking at an ad in a magazine or a newspaper and it's less than one second it's like 0.57 seconds so it's incredibly a short amount of time and marketers know this and so whenever they urge people to sort of streamline they're going for two main things they're going for recognizability so every time someone looks at your page even if it's for 0.5 seconds if they are becoming familiar with your style of photography, with your font, with your colors, with all kinds of things that are easily sort of assessed within just a second or two, eventually people are going to become familiar enough that either on a conscious or subconscious level, they are going to start familiarizing and recognizing yellow and gomi sands and this kind of picture with this kind of grain to your content. The other things that marketers sort of are aware of is that they're trying to the best of their ability to forego any confusion. And one of the ways we know this is because a strategy that marketers will use when they're trying to sell something like a vice is that they will purposefully put out marketing material or studies, even if they're not great quality studies, to sort of create confusion. So one thing I remember learning about in one of my health classes in college was that the tobacco industry, sort of when it was beginning to lose its footing in the American public and all of a sudden people were becoming more aware that it was not safe, was they pushed a couple of really flimsy studies about how smoking was actually helpful. And their goal wasn't to convince you that it was helpful. Rather, if you see contradicting studies, so maybe you see 10 studies that say smoking is very bad for you, can cause lung cancer, but you see one or two that the news write-up can say something like people who smoke have 4% less asthma. The point is that the tobacco company have created just enough of a little bit of confusion in the consumer base that a message as clear and robust as smoking is bad for you, it causes cancer, just that little seed of confusion can help their marketing strategy. So the point is marketers are always really aware that if you can create confusion, if they don't know which brand is which, if they don't know if it's good or if it's bad, if it's natural or if it's not natural, whatever message they're trying to get across, if there's confusion, that that's going to affect sales and brand recognizability. Okay, and I know at this point in the podcast, you might be thinking, well, of course, niching down is good because everyone always brings it up. And if it wasn't good advice, it wouldn't be at the top of every 101 list. How does that help me as an artist? I still feel really unsure about niching down. And you're totally right. And I'll get to that. So why would focusing down, niching down be not good advice for artists or 
more importantly, why does that always feel kind of like suffocating advice to an artist? At least I use the word suffocating because that's how it felt when I first really knew what niching down meant. And the reason for that is pretty simple. As an artist, even if you are a pretty streamlined artist already, even if like you have one subject and one style, the idea that your ability to sell hinges on you staying stagnant in some capacity can be really daunting and frustrating and it can feel like your whole creative process is being hindered in some capacity let alone if you're the kind of artist who paints at a totally different style who paints really inconsistently who maybe you even switch medium pretty regularly this can be really frustrating and my next piece of advice is there are certain aspects of your creative practice that you cannot let marketing touch Okay, so this is how I've explained it in my social media marketing course. And it's an idea that as a business owner, a small business owner and as an artist, you have to wear two hats. So there is artist Sari and there's marketing Sari. And sometimes they butt heads, but the most important thing about these two distinct jobs is that I never let marketing Sari sit at my easel. And I try as hard as I can to not let artist Sari post and come up with marketing strategies and run the website, right? Artist Sari is a little too sensitive to some of the marketing. (laughs) And marketing Sari doesn't always make really good, authentic, creative choices when she's sitting at the easel. I'm sure I don't need to harp this point on this podcast, but in case you haven't heard this, It's the nature of an artist to be curious, to be ever-changing and evolving, to quest for novelty and grow, whether it's in your skill or what you're interested in. And for some people, that's going to be more dramatic than others, but it's part of what you do as an artist to change and evolve. And while this might come at the dismay of the marketing version of yourself, I also think that artists have something that most other businesses don't have. And it's that personal narrative and that connection and that uniqueness and authenticity that comes with being a visual artist. And it can be complicated in this day and age, especially with social media, because a lot of times your art is sandwiched between a Little Caesars ad, a Razor ad, and someone trying to sell their grandma's tea recipes. And there's something that... Even a little Caesars marketing budget and ability to saturate. And there's something that even that wonderful artisanal tea that's so good and has a great story, there's something that neither one of those businesses can do that artists can do. And that's to really connect to people. That's to be incredibly authentic and transparent. And I have also mentioned whenever I'm teaching social media marketing that Sometimes there's a certain amount of trade-off when you're running a business and your inability to niche in the way that might be desirable in a more traditional marketing sense, the trade-off for that is that you are authentic in a way that marketing teams who sit in boardrooms, who are trying to connect with an audience, they wish they were as authentic and relatable as an artist. Okay, but I promise I'm not just going to lead you with a platitude because as true as that is, the, the ability for an artist to come up with these closer niche connections that Little Caesars could never. The truth is that you can find other ways to sort of niche down so that you can support both your creative practice and help to foster that really deep connection you get as an artist who's selling their work and their story. And I may have just alluded to it right there. I would say that the number one thing you do if you disregard everything else in this episode is get good at telling stories. Not all art is incredibly profound. As someone who's made both profound art and then a lot of just really silly, happy art, you don't have to make the deepest art on the world to be able to come up with a good story that can help you sell your art. The point is, is that if you niche down with your story, it can really help connect the dots when your art doesn't feel as connected as it may feel to you. And truthfully, I believe it's my experience writing artist statements that's really helped me with my marketing because basically I just sort of remix what I'm doing with my artist statement and use that as my copy whether it's for one post or for a whole month or even for a whole year, I'll utilize something that helps to clarify my work as a way to pull people in, engage people, and help the viewer connect the dots. 
So I was talking with some of my not started art school students in a one-on-one recently and one of my students said that I'm still learning. I just graduated from school and I'm trying to teach myself these techniques and I'm worried that people won't understand what I'm doing because I'm just trying out new styles and techniques every day. My advice to this artist was to let their journey be their story. Talk about it every post, every other post that Art school is wonderful and it can teach you a lot, but there's still so much you have to learn as an artist even after you graduate. And the journey of finding your style can look like what I'm doing. And then you show people what that looks like and you talk through what you're learning. And it can be really short. It can be, today I played with oil pastels. I've always been curious about this because of mark making and because of my previous love of drawing and I wanted to incorporate it with the lush colors of paints. Here's what I'm doing and then you do a call to action. You ask people what they're doing and you let them know where they can buy this piece of art. And I always view the role of storytelling as sort of twofold. One instance is that you are directly communicating and talking with the people who are the most interested in your artwork. You're explaining what you're doing, why you're making the choices, and even if you don't have answers, it's okay to just tell them the questions that you're working with. As an artist, it's not always our job to have everything perfectly figured out. I feel like learning what questions you're asking is half the job of being an artist. So tell people, these are the questions I'm working through. What do you think? What do you think the answers are? And sort of openly talk about that and evolve and grow and show them what you're doing and how you're learning about it, who you're reading about, other artists you're inspired by. But to have sort of an ongoing, almost like an intimate dialogue with the people who care and who listen and who are willing to show up for you is not only a great way to sort of clarify what you're doing, but it really helps you to form that authentic connection. The other thing too is that you want your story to be concise enough that someone who, I always visualize this, someone who's really excited about your work is talking to one of their friends or coworkers or maybe their aunt and they say, oh, there's this artist you'd really love. She does this great thing with color and then X, Y, Z. You want them to be able to within one or two sentences summarize what your thing is, what your shtick is and Granted, it's hard to summarize someone's whole art into one sentence, but I believe it's worth the time, energy, and effort to try to synthesize and distill a message that can be delivered within a sentence or two. And don't worry, it's not going to undermine your art. There can be layers and tears to what you're doing. So I understand that if someone has a really quick pitch for my art, They're going to say something like, oh, she's really good with color and she plays with shimmer and glitter and really mundane objects. And maybe there's a class element. Sometimes people say that, sometimes people won't. But I understand that someone's summary, it may not quite gather and nail the depth of what I'm doing with my art, but it doesn't take from my art necessarily. To give you one final way I sort of help to conceptualize this is whenever I'm creating a caption, whether I use that as just a written caption or I use it as a voiceover, I always make sure that my first sentence or maybe two summarizes what I want to say with my entire post or piece of artwork and then the following paragraphs can really lay it out. So even if someone doesn't spend the full 20 minutes, 15 minutes to read or to listen to everything or, you know, five minutes or whatever, if they just read and scanned over the first sentence or two, they would still understand generally what I'm saying and what I'm about. Some tools to help you with this is to practice writing. And if you're not a great writer, I totally understand. Some people have legitimate struggles with writing in terms of learning disabilities or dyslexia or other things, or maybe time is a constraint, or maybe you just haven't practiced at writing very much because you spent all your time making art. This is all totally understandable. I would suggest on one hand, as much as you can to try writing. Again, you don't have to write a novel. It can just be writing a few sentences, talking about other artists you really like and how that pertains to your work. But if you don't have those resources, I would recommend finding a friend who's a writer and maybe doing an art trade or having them help you or coach you in some capacity. 
And then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't recommend one of my favorite books when it comes to writing, and that is The Power of Myth. And this book is really great because it talks about all the different archetypes that stories can have. And I found that by sort of plugging in all of my narratives into roughly this sort of model, and by making sure that the viewer feels like they can engage with the core of the story, I find that storytelling in this capacity really helps my artwork and helps me to be able to craft something that doesn't just feel ambiguous and wordy and run on which of course was always my problem with writing. Hey all, I just wanted to let you know that I'm hosting a painting retreat March 22nd through 27th in the beautiful Texas hill country of Wimberley, Texas. I'll be teaching my still life and landscape techniques as we relax on a 100-acre property situated 45 minutes away from downtown Austin. There are five unique lodging accommodations to choose from plus a drive-in option for local guests. We'll be enjoying chef-prepared meals so every single meal of the day is already provided for you and soak in all the inspiration that the beautiful property has to offer. And y'all, if you haven't been down to the Texas Hill Country, it is so stunning. All the locals vacation out there. It's a lot of beauty and nature, and hopefully we're going to be super inspired by that as we learn plein air painting and lots of other great technique. So sign up today by heading over to my website, sari.studio, and clicking the Texas Painting Retreat tab. I hope to see you there. It's going to be a blast. Okay, so that's the storytelling. Again, if you do nothing else, try really hard to work on that aspect. But there are other ways you can streamline. So another really important point that I'd like to make with this episode is that if you don't want to niche down with what you're actually physically doing with your art, again, totally fine, nothing wrong with that, you are going to probably have to find other ways to niche down. And before this sounds really scary, a lot of the other things I'm going to mention are a lot of work maybe for a week or a couple days and then it actually ends up being easier for you in the long run. So one example of this is by sort of picking out a font and ID or like color package. Okay, this doesn't mean that all your colors necessarily have to perfectly align with this. And if you're someone who's really, really varied, so all of your art is dramatically different. Maybe you have a really moody body of work that's all gray and neutral, and maybe you have a more vibrant body of work. It's okay. This try the best to your ability. But I find that most artists generally occupy a color story. And I don't just mean all blues and purples or something that specific. But for me, I tend to err on the more vibrant side and slightly warmer. So a year ago, whenever I finally bit the bullet and had someone help me with my website because I had been doing it all myself (laughs) prior to that, one of the things I asked for was a font pack and some colors. And what we did was we picked through some of my more iconic bodies of work and we picked out five colors, one of those being black, one of those being off-white, and then three other colors. And then we also picked a font. And what this is great for is anytime I have a post that requires text or if I do something in stories or even on my website, I use all the same font and that builds that recognizability. And even if only people pick up on this sort of subconsciously, it's really nice to have that consistency in what you're doing because it's not about making your artwork super consistent. It's just about adding as many elements as you can to streamline For me personally, picking just one or two fonts doesn't take away from my artistry. You know, it may be different for different people if they do a lot of text-based art, for example. But for me, text in my art is not really a thing I have to contend with. And so by narrowing it down, having those choices already pre-made, this is something I can do with very little resistance that helps me to become a little more streamlined, a little more recognizable, And it's not something that I have to give up some creative integrity to do. Another thing you can do is really niche down and focus on who you're talking to. And again, something that I want to keep saying throughout this episode, and I really think is a takeaway message, is all of this niching down marketing advice. If you hear it, if you think through each one of these individual things and you sort of stop for a second, maybe even visualize what it looks like in your practice, if it doesn't feel like it's taking from your the integrity of your art, if it doesn't feel like if I niche down who I talk to, I won't be able to say my message, if, it, if it's fine, if it doesn't sort of unsettle you in that capacity, then try as much as possible to 
to niche down in these ways so that you can play and explore more with your actual artwork. Okay, but what does it look like to niche down who you're talking to? So an example of this with me is that sometimes I'm speaking to art students and sometimes I'm speaking to my collectors and knowing kind of who those people are and who you're talking to can really help probably more with your storytelling, but it can also help you set a tone with your whole account. And I know this advice, the idea of niching down who you're talking to might seem a little bit odd because in theory, don't you want to talk to everyone? Don't you want to cast a really wide net? Another truth about marketing is that the more specific of a person you can talk to, the more you can make your copy and your message seem like a handwritten letter to one very specific person, the more connection you'll have with that person, the more trust you'll build over time, and the more likely you are to have someone commit to buying something, and of course eventually even something that's more high-end, like a big painting. But the trade-off, of course, being that when you talk to someone and you call them out almost literally by name, you do sort of run the risk of excluding people. And certainly it's not something I can tell you through a podcast who you should be talking to. Instead, I'm really going to pose this as a question to you. Is there a specific group that I'm already talking to? Can I just hone or tweak that slightly? And you can always do market research. I have done so much market research in my stories. That sounds like some big fancy MBA word. But what I mean by market research is ask people who's listening, who's here, do a Q&A, how did you find my artwork, what pieces of art stand out to you, tell me about yourself. I have a, a long track record of really buddying up and talking to a lot of my collectors over the years. A lot of times they start out just curious about my artwork and I've really grown with them, probably because I'm a smaller artist or at least have been. I have a really kind of intimate connection with these people and so I've learned over time through all these different metrics who I'm talking to, and I can sort of narrow down who I'm talking to. Granted, my artwork is a little bit more broad, so there might be someone who perhaps you're making artwork about a specific identity or experience that maybe is kind of niche. If it's helpful, you might try to talk more specifically to people who have that experience. Again, it's a trade-off, and I certainly can't tell you what that trade-off looks like, but if that's something you're interested, then definitely look into target audience and how to talk to those specific people. And my final piece of advice for this episode is to find some space and time in your schedule to look at your data, look at your website analytics, look at your comments, look at who you've sold to, and ask yourself, In what ways have I already niched down? And then once you find this answer, ask yourself if continuing to stay niche down is beneficial for me. Now, what I'm trying to find here is ease. So that's something that I think is really important in your creative business. Not everything needs to feel like a battle or hard or let you're sacrificing. You may already niche down and not even know it. So let's say you're someone who you do a lot of murals and paintings on walls inside people's houses or or whatever and maybe your subject is really varied and your style is really varied. So in your head you're thinking well I'm not really niche down. I keep playing with different styles and you know I keep painting all these different places but maybe you're blinding yourself to the fact that oh your niche is that you're kind of a muralist and if you can look at that and say well that's something I don't mind continuing in the future you can then pursue marketing strategies within that niche. You can do things like utilizing hashtags within niches. You can subscribe to pages who highlight and show mural artists from around the country or in your region. And you can find community and opportunity even through things like grants and residencies that maybe market themselves to mural artists. Along those same lines, you may already be niche down in the fact that you're in a specific geographic location. If you're a Texas artist, you might be able to find resources and grants and community and projects through even your region. So there's other ways to sort of find those niches that can help you in your business that don't involve sacrificing your creative practice. In fact, I think it's really important to try to look where you have niche down. If you're a feminine presenting person, you might be in a position where you can niche down as a woman or a feminine artist. And the last thing I'll say is it's okay to allow a niche to expire. I mean this both in the sense that 
if you have committed to something that maybe wasn't a concern to you, like let's say your colors for your branding, and you notice that all of a sudden those things don't feel right, there's nothing wrong with rebranding. This happens all the time. But I also want to bring up the fact that there's this time quality to niches too, to let you know that things don't always last forever. And my example of this is whenever I was pretty new at my art practice in earnest, one of the first ways I found some fairly consistent income was doing home portraits. So this would have been about a year and a half, maybe two years into doing art pretty regularly. And I really enjoyed painting architectural landscape around South and East Austin. And at this gallery I was at, people kept asking, could I come out and paint their houses? And this was happening at a regular enough clip that it became a pretty substantial part of my income. Now, if you had told me you can only paint houses forever, I would have probably gotten really sad because I was still in a mindset where I was hoping to grow and change and I wanted to eventually do portraits as well. And I wasn't in love with the way my style was at that time. I was proud of it, but I still was very much hoping to grow and change and evolve. But for about a year and a half, maybe almost two years, definitely about a year and a half, doing these home portraits really helped out my business. It helped me to, of course, gain income. It helped me to gain some notoriety. People would come over and say, oh, what a great house portrait. Can I, you know, who painted this? And then I got a lot of work through that way. I was able to open and advertise commissions and get work through that. And so I would say that there was a time when I kind of maybe was known for my architectural landscapes and more specifically my house portraits. And the thing is, eventually I came into a season where this no longer felt exciting or interesting for me and I shifted and it, obviously there's some discomfort to this, um, you know, turning down some commissions and obviously it's a bit of a privilege to be able to do so and I was fortunate that I was able to start selling other work that I was making and not to say that I was shutting off commissions entirely, but I was able to sort of begin to pivot out of just being someone who did home portraits to pursue other things. And I'm really glad I did that. I'm glad I didn't take the niching down to heart and make it some existential thing that kept me painting house paintings when I didn't want to. And, you know, because of that, I'm the artist I am now. So obviously in hindsight, it was a good choice, but I always have so much sympathy for artists who maybe have found something that works for them and they're nervous to pivot away. And my advice for that specific situation would be, just like I said earlier, lean into your story. Talk about it. Having to change and move away from something that offered you safety and comfort and was familiar because you're growing and changing isn't nearly as niche as that seems. Because the truth is, we all experience that kind of growth. And whether or not you have an art practice, that's a very relatable experience. You'll find your footing again, you'll find something that makes you happy, and perhaps you'll niche down again, maybe for another couple of years, and you may always be the kind of person who changes and grows. But the most important thing is that you stay tethered to a creative practice that really fulfills you and keeps you going and keeps you inspired. And maybe in that process, you don't grow your following as big as someone who's stuck with one thing their whole career. But if that extra audience kept you chained to something that made you unhappy, then maybe that's not as bad of a trade-off as it feels like. Remember that you're an artist first and a small business second. I know that that can be a hard thing to grapple with, especially if you're in the weeds and you're wanting to pay for new paint. I totally understand but it's important, it's such good advice to really listen to your own creative journey first and pivot, niche down where it makes sense. I hope this was helpful, guys. This is really just some of my advice and anecdotes that I've experienced, and there's a whole world of marketing out there. Some of it works for artists and some of it doesn't, but make sure that you listen to your gut and follow your instinct. I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope it was helpful. I hope you gained something from it. Make sure to leave your reviews in the review section of the podcast app. It helps channels like this grow, and I always really appreciate the feedback. Thanks for being here, and happy creating.